everyone. Welcome to LifeCo. We are so excited. It's Crew Sunday. Don't forget, don't forget to get your donut and your candy and popcorn out there after. But more importantly, sign up for a crew. Crews are our life groups that meet different times and different places with different people, um, different topics and different things that we're doing, activities, friendships, and Bible study, different kinds of crews going on. And we would love for you to join that. I know that Ed already made the announcement, but maybe I'm just saying, like, if you see a, a crew called Set Free, you might stumble across a Set Free crew. If you want to get set free, sign up for set free. <laughs> Amen. No, it's going to be great. I, I encourage you to sign up for a crew. It doesn't matter if it's set free or another. Sign up for a crew if it's an activity or friendship or a Bible study. Um, so we are starting a brand new series today on the book of Ephesians. Everyone's like, oh, really? No, listen. It's much different when you teach a book of the Bible than when you preach a topic. When you preach a topic, you could jump all over the different scriptures in the Bible. But when you study a book, especially that we're doing it as quick as we're doing it, some people could do Ephesians over a year on, on a weekly basis, but like we're doing it in five weeks. Um, so we're going to handle Ephesians chapter one today. But when you do a book study, it's different because it's more teaching than preaching. Because you need to get the word in you. Line upon line, precept upon precept. I have learned over the last 41 years in serving Jesus that it's as, it's as thrilling <laughs> to be sometimes in a Bible study than it is to be in a worship service on a Sunday morning. Because that word gets written upon your heart and you're forever changed. You're for, when, you, when you really read and open the book and read it and study it and own it for yourself, the book of James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. What does that mean? It means that when we let the word into us, we let, you know, they prof the, the prophets prophesied that in the new covenant, God would no longer write his law upon tablets of stone, but he would write it upon the tablets of our hearts so that we would always have the word in us. And that's what happens a lot. It does happen here on a Sunday morning as well because you're getting the word of God. But even more so when we study the word together. So that's what you're going to be getting today, a study of the book of Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians is broken down into six chapters. The first three are really about where, who we are positionally in Christ. And then the chapters four, five, and six are more like our duties in Christ after we know who we are in Christ, right? Once we know who we are, but chapter one is all about who we are, thus the title of my message, who we are in in Christ. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name right now, we give ourselves as disciples to you. Lord, a disciple is one who sits at your feet to learn of you. God, you've given us your word. Bring your word and write it upon our hearts, God, that we might live for you, Lord, that we might live out that which you are etching upon our hearts, Lord. Father, we, we open our hearts to you today. We pray that we would leave here with more faith than when we came in. We pray, God, that we would be set free from the things, God, that we've believed that aren't true and that your truth coming by the spirit of truth would set us free today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. I find, so, so Paul wrote three letters during this time that he was writing the letter to the Ephesian church, okay? He wrote three letters, but he was in prison. He was imprisoned for two years in Rome. I find it interesting that he could write three letters to three different churches while he's in a prison cell. I find it interesting that, you see, because our problem a lot of times is 
when we're in certain circumstances or we have certain conditions in our lives, we tend to judge God and say, this can't be of you. Now just get me out of this mess and then I'll serve you. Isn't that what we do? We just like, oh God, just God, please get me out of this, get me out of this. God, is today the day of deliverance? God, is today. No, maybe God has you there for a purpose. Now, what put Paul in prison? He was preaching the gospel. I know sometimes we get ourselves in our own messes sometimes. That's true. And some, sometimes we need to take inventory. Lord, am I in this mess? Am I in this prison? Because I got myself here. But listen, for, 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 the, for the purpose of this teaching, Paul couldn't reflect back on himself and say, it must be because of the sin in my life that I'm in this prison cell. No. Paul was serving Christ, preaching the gospel, and he got thrown into a Roman prison. You see, the problem is that we look at our present day conditions and then judge God or forget the truth of what God says about us. We forget his promises to us from his word. Let's look at it right here in Ephesians, starting with chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, how can Paul be praying and preaching grace? What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor upon you. Paul's in prison. Is that the favor of God? Is that the favor of God? I mean, he says grace and peace. What's peace? It's the peace that passes all understanding. It's having peace with God through, through our relationship with Christ. An undisturbed peace. Like that river of peace. I got peace like a river. In our hearts, while he sits in a prison cell in Rome. How can that be? If that was one of us, we'd be like, get me out of here. Or we'd be saying, God, is there something wrong in my life? Did I do something to get me into this predicament? We get caught up in, 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 in the, the mindsets. And we start going down trails in our minds. It must be because of this or it must be because of that. Listen, sometimes we need to stop and say, you know what? God's word transcends my current situation, my current conditions. God transcends and he transcends. I'm going to be able to say his grace never changes. His love never changes. His mercy is new every morning. No matter what predicament I find myself in, he is still God. He'll still be faithful. Yeah, I'm in this prison. Maybe God's going to teach me something. Maybe I'm going to go to that deep place where God's going to show me and train me and teach me something that I need to know. Yes. Pastor Philip said it the other day, Pastor Philip from Germany, he said, you will never learn on the safety of the shore what God teaches you in the midst of the storm. If you never go through anything, you will never know that God can deliver you out of it. If you're never in this kind of predicament, listen, we... we that's why we're supposed to seek the Lord, search for him with all of your heart. Lord, find out what it is, why it is that I'm here. But listen, never, never stop trusting in the faithfulness of God. Because he will be faithful to you. Listen, as soon as you open your mouth, you can only expect good things from God. I don't care what your conditions are. I don't care where you are in life right now. When you pray and you seek the Lord, he can only bring good out of what seems like a bad situation in your life. God, are you mad at me? Did I do something wrong that I'm in this prison? And that becomes a prison for many people. I'm in the prison of my own mind, trying to figure this out. I'm trusting God, I'm trusting God. You know what? Just endure it. Paul told Timothy, endure hardship as a soldier. 
fight the good fight of faith. Why is faith a fight? Because everything within us wants comfort. Everything within us wants to stay out of the battle. <laughs> you know, you watch these romance movies and always during one part of the movie, there's some kind of conflict and some kind of fight. And one of the people that are in the relationship huffs up and storms out of the room and <sighs> runs away. We've taught our kids when you get married and you get into a conflict, because how many know you're never going to agree on everything forever? Come on, husbands and wives, say amen. amen. Oh, yeah, now I know you're listening. But too many times we want to run away from the problem. When God says no, God told me early on, he said, no, you sit down eyeball to eyeball. And you look at them, you say, no, we're going to work this out. I'm in this forever. God put us together. We're supposed to be together. We're husbands and wives forever. Right? Come on, we need a good dose of this sometimes. We're going to work this out. I'm not leaving this room. I don't care if it were up all night. We followed the principle. Listen, Jerry and I hardly ever fight. Trust me. We've been married for 38 years coming up on. But we, we well... I like to believe that I hardly ever fight. But we follow the scripture, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Don't, don't, listen, we, I would rather get two hours of sleep with a resolved conflict than eight hours of sleep and wake up mad. I'm giving some good marriage counseling right now. You're about to ca cancel your counseling session with your spouse. <laughs> Amen. So why could Paul preach grace in the midst of prison sentence? Why could he preach? How could he possibly be preaching peace? Here's the answer. The reason Paul can preach and speak grace to a church from a prison cell is because he knew that God's grace was sufficient. We sang it before. For whatever we face in life. He said this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace, God said, Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, come on, this has got to be our anthem as, as Christians. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Paul's getting through to them that, yeah, I'm in a prison cell, but God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. He's going to bring me through this trial. And he's going to teach me something that I could never learn without going through it. Listen, we need to understand that God is always good. And he's always up to something good. And even though we walk through troubles of all kinds, he still is good. The things that we walk through, the things that God allows us to walk through sometimes, listen, they're not meant to debilitate us or to sideline us or knock us out of the race. I may be going through a difficult time or stuck in a situation I don't want to be in, but nothing is going to steal my praise. Nothing's going to stop me from trusting God regardless of what I'm looking at. I came in this morning over the last two weeks, I've had this clogging in my ears that I feel like I'm swimming in an ocean. Did I go to the doctor? No. Should I go to the doctor? Probably. But, but, but I'm like, I'm over here and I'm worshiping God and all I can hear is myself inside my head. And it's like, Lenny, you're, you're off key. You're off key. But listen, it didn't stop me from praising him. Oh, get the doctor, 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 doctor. Listen, nothing's going to stop my praise. Nothing's going to stop my praise. 
Listen, when we praise, it transcends our horizontal plane and what we're going through on this earth and connects with a God who sees it all, who knows it all, and is able to deliver you through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. God's going to bring you all the way through. Amen. Somebody got it. The things that God allows us to be in actually become the means by which we grow. Listen, how does a baby grow? They fall down a lot. How do they grow? They get a little pat-pat on the butt-butt. Am I allowed to say that in church? Right? A little, mm. right? It's not easy. (laughs) it's not easy but the things that we go through in life actually become the means by which we mature if we know listen we'll never get any wiser or stronger if we don't go through the things that God allows us to go through but I'm not talking about being strong in ourselves well I've been through a lot you know I've come through a lot yeah I got it on my resume I've, I've done a lot I've really done a lot in this world No, I'm not talking about the strength and the wisdom that we gain in ourselves. I'm talking about the wisdom and the strength that we get in him. Didn't John the Baptist say he must increase and I must decrease? So when, listen, and that's what this Christianity is all about. It's the great exchange where it's like, Lord, I want your power in me. I'm weak. I'll boast in my weakness. I'll boast in what God allows me to go through because I know that when I'm weak, I'm strong in him. Are you with me? I'm strong in him. Listen, I get up here every time I got to do prayer and praise, communion, preach, whatever. I'm like back there and I'm like, oh God, I can't do this on my own. I can't preach on my own. I'm a stubborn German, not every German is stubborn, but German, (laughs) German, who grew up with no communication. I don't know in myself how to communicate well, but my confidence is not in myself. There's a big difference between self-confidence and God confidence. And there's nothing wrong in saying I'm weak, but I'm strong in you, Jesus. In the same area where I'm weak, Lord, I need you to compensate and make up the difference. And then he does exceedingly abundantly above. Because God, not only did God raise me and save me and raise me up 41 years ago, but God opened my mouth to be able to communicate someone who could never really communicate right before. He put me out in front of thousands of people. Why? Because he knows that I know that my confidence and strength are in him. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This is Ephesians 1, who we are in Christ. Here's my first point. In Christ, we are blessed. We, We sang it before. I wrote it down on my phone. Oh, God. I'm recording myself. It's crazy. I wrote it down before. You have, we just sang it. You have blessed me and I know it. So I owe you my praise. You have, man, that song brought me back. Woo. 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 I mean, it wasn't just because my son John was singing it. That helped. But man, did I feel God. Speaking to me, Lord, I owe you my praise because of all that you've done. And what else did it go on to say? When I think of all you've done, all the ways you brought me through, when I think of all your love, I could never say enough thank yous. Why? Because it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not you in your own strength. Let me move on. In Christ, we are blessed. Ephesians 1, 3. Okay, we're up to the third verse so far. 
We've got uh, 20 something verses to get through this morning. <laughs> no, I promise. We're about to step on the accelerator. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The word blessed in the Greek is eulageo, which is broken into two words, eu, you, not you, but you, eu, which, which means <laughs> prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> and logos, eulageo, you, prosperity, logos, is the spoken word from God. So, when the Bible says that you are blessed, it's not like you, it, it, this is what it means. It, <laughs> it means that God has breathed and spoken a word of prosperity over you. I'm not talking about financial prosperity. I'm talking about a God who knows what we're walking through. He understands what we're walking through. And at the right time, he breathes and speaks his word over our circumstances. And that is the definition of blessed. We prosper in the word of God. I'm so blessed because, man, I was in this mess and a word came from heaven that set me free, that blessed me. We think, oh, if I just could pay this bill or I could, listen, that's not, that's not prosperity. Yeah, let that come too when we put God in his, give God the preeminence, give God first place. Let that come. But prosperity and blessing is when he speaks his word over us. Isaiah 55, 11 is not in your, it's not in our notes, but it says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Listen, we're going through stuff. Every one of you, me included, going through stuff. And God initiates a word to us. What if you got a knock on your front door and it was Jesus? Would you let him in? Some of you are like, no. I don't want him to see the stuff in my... But most of us would be like, yeah, Jesus, come in. Because we're desperate for a word from God. God, I need you to speak to my situation. God, I need you to talk to me. God, I need you to show me something. Life doesn't make sense. This is hard. But God has given us this book. The spoken word of God. All scripture is inspired. God breathed. And it is good for us. And we need to open up our word and we need to say, God, you do have a word. You are on my front door. You do have a word for me. I want to know what you're saying to my situation. Amen? Next point. In Christ, we are chosen, adopted, and accepted. Ephesians 1.4. Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I know this is deep. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. You're chosen. He chose you. He picked you out. Before the world was formed, he knew all about you and he chose you. He loves you that much. He adopted you. He brought you into his family. He didn't just pick you out. He said, come and be part of my family. And he accepted you. 
when the world is rejecting you, canceling you, Jesus is accepting you. Come on, you are adopted, you are chosen, you are accepted. I love this first part where he talks about being chosen. We know the scripture that says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. But he goes on to say here that we were chose by God before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. What does that mean? It doesn't mean when we say that we're chosen, we're adopted, we're accepted. Listen, it doesn't mean that we run amok just because we're chosen. I'm a child of God and I can do what I can do. I will do whatever I want to do. No, stop. He chose you to walk blamelessly. How can we do that? Can we do that? No, we cannot do it without his strength. So, Lord, how can I walk? You said, be holy as I am holy. How can we possibly be holy? His holiness can never, my holiness can never match. It's like as filthy rags before him, right? But there's a, there's a caveat. He's called us to live for him. It's, he hasn't just chosen us and adopted us and accepted us so you can just have a status of, I'm in the family of God. Praise him. No, he chose you to walk out and to live out and pursue him and ask the kind of questions that we're asking this morning. Ephesians 2.8 says that for by grace you've been saved through faith and it is not of, of works, it's the gift of God. Not of works, least any man should boast, for we are his workmanship or his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has ordained from the foundation of the world. So he chose you from the foundation, he adopted you from the foundation, he accepted you from the foundation, but he also has a plan and he also has a work for you to do. And that is what you are called to be and you are called to do. Not just to be in him, but to live out why he saved you. Ephesians 1.5 in the NLT says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. Isn't that good news? Did I lose you somewhere? You are accepted, you're, re you're not rejected. You no longer have to fight to find acceptance with certain groups of people any longer. You uh, found it when he found you and accepted you just as you are. Here's my next point. In Christ, we're redeemed and forgiven. This is all Ephesians 1. I know it's teaching, and so we got to like kind of be like a little bit deliberate with it. But isn't it good? In Christ, we are redeemed and forgiven. What does that mean? To be redeemed means to be bought back. Satan owned you, but Christ went to the cross to pay the price for you, for your sins to be forgiven, and for you to get snatched back from the clutch of Satan himself. Come on, he's delivered you. He's brought you into his own self. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We've been purchased by the blood of Christ. To be redeemed means you've been brought back. You've been purchased by the blood of Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. 1 Peter 1, 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of of Christ as of a lamb without blemish. When Jesus went to the cross, he had you on his mind. He, I'm going to redeem her. I'm going to redeem him. I'm going to pay the price for them to come back to me again. Here's my next point. Is in Christ, we have a glorious inheritance. A glorious inheritance. Listen, when I know heaven is my destiny, it gives me peace on earth. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. When I know that Christ came to save me and I put my faith in him, it's the underlying stream. I've got peace like a river. 
It's an underlying stream in my life that no matter what might go wrong on this earth, I know that ultimately I'm going to be with him. He's gone ahead of, and he's prepared a place for me that where he is, I may be also. Ephesians 1.11 says, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God has chosen you and he's chosen you to have an inheritance. What does that mean? Not only heaven, but here on earth, we have the inheritance of the, of the promises of God. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. There's an inheritance that we receive from God here on earth. God answers prayer. God hears us from heaven and he answers prayer. We have a glorious heritage, a glorious inheritance in him. We have hope that no one can take away. We have hope. We have faith. The world wants to define us, listen, by what we have in the horizontal. The world esteems things like a good career, a big bank account, prestige or position, success, good looks, but unfortunately, those things don't really bring happiness. They are temporary. I wish they weren't temporary. <laughs> Jerry and I have known each other since I was 17. I'm now 25, and <laughs> I just keep getting older and older. <laughs> like, you know... I don't want to admit too much stuff, but like sometimes it's even difficult to get up off the couch. And, you know, so I'm like, where, where, what happened to 17? <laughs> I don't know why I told you that. <laughs> oh, that the, it's, it's fleeting. The things of this world are fleeting. They're only temporary. Listen, I think we need to take care of ourselves and we need to like, be the best version of ourselves we possibly can be. But I can't drink from the fountain of youth. But I know that I have him. <laughs> the Bible says that though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. So I'm actually getting younger on the inside. I know I don't act like I'm 63. But I am grateful to God that I've got a glorious inheritance. We, ha we had a loved one, a beautiful relative on Jerry's side of the family that passed away not too long ago. And she had a successful career. She was working for prestigious law firms. She um, had many prestigious jobs in her life. She was married for a short time and then her husband passed away, unfortunately. But she loved to be, a to be able to come and go as she pleased, buy cars for cash, um, shop in New York City, to do all the things that she did and more power to her. But when the end of her life came, she was in a nursing home, barely able to talk or walk. She was inactive. She was all alone. Her final days proved that you can't take it with you. This life is futile. All she accumulated in her life lost its meaning. I want to make this statement. In Christ, we are not identified by the things we possess. These are only fleeting. We are defined by the one who possesses us. I'm going to read it again. In Christ, we are not identified by the things we possess. We are defined by the one who possesses us. Amen. You can give God praise. So now we're going to put on the foot to the accelerator. At the end of chapter one, Paul prays a prayer over the church in Ephesus. And I'm going to pray that prayer over you right now. Is that okay? 
from verse 27, I'm sorry, 17 to 21. Are you ready? I, I want you to put yourself in a posture of receiving. Receive this prayer because God allowed this prayer to be in this book so that today I could read this prayer or pray this prayer over you. Is that okay? Okay, let's receive from God this prayer. I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us, his holy ones. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm. And now he is exalted as first above every ruler, authority, government, and realm of power in existence. He is gloriously enthroned over every name that is ever praised, not only in this age, but in the age that is coming. Isn't that a powerful prayer? It's like he summarizes everything that he was trying to say to them and he puts it in a prayer. We're gonna close this message. And listen, I look forward to the next four weeks when we're gonna dive into Ephesians 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's gonna be awesome. Listen, you're gonna come away from this series knowing God's word and what he says of who you are in Christ. Amen. But I've got a declaration that I want us to stand. Can we all stand together? I want us to stand and make this declaration together as a church because it summarizes everything that we're talking about here this morning. Are you guys good with this? Are you ready to make a declaration? Listen, when you make a declaration, you might say, well, I'm, I, I'm not gonna talk. Listen, when you open your mouth and you confess or declare something, it aligns with what you believe in your heart, that's when you're gonna start to see the changes take place in your life. Are you guys with me? Let's, let's do this together and mean it from your heart. Let's make this declaration together. Ready? On your mark, it said go. I am a child of God. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. God has spoken his word over me and I have received it into my heart. I have been accepted, chosen, and adopted into his family. I now belong to Jesus. I have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and I am forgiven of all of my sins. I am no longer bound in the prisons of my own failures. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am no longer bound in fear or the lies that I have believed about myself. Jesus has broken every evil bond that I had with my past. I am no longer a slave to the opinions of others. I now live for Jesus and who he says I am. God's grace gives me strength to do what I could never do in my own strength. I have a glorious inheritance. My place in heaven has been reserved. Jesus has prepared a place for me and he has given me his Holy Spirit as the guarantee. The eyes of my understanding have been enlightened. I know I have been called of God to fulfill his purposes in the earth. I have received power and authority over all the power of the enemy. I am seated in heavenly places in Christ. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Listen, God bless you. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you, God, for this great church. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. I thank you that you have built our faith this morning. And God, we thank you, God, for your word. Your word is truth, Lord. We give you thanks and praise for all that's going to happen. 
Lord, in our lives. God, you know our future and you know exactly where we are right now. You're going to bring us through all the way to the other side. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I love you so much.